All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Cindy Zhu with the Department of Energy. Welcome to the Better Buildings Alliance peer learning call featuring the Renewables Integration Tech Team and the Commercial Real Estate Team. Today, our topic will be focused on energy storage and its relevancy for commercial and institutional buildings. Next, please. First, I will share a few updates from both the Renewables Integration Tech Team and the Commercial Real Estate Team. Next, our Renewables Team Lead, Jay Pidey Pidey, will take us through an overview of the current state of energy storage technology. Then we will hear about the benefits of energy storage from Carl Mansfield of Sharp Energy Storage Solutions, followed by a case study from Troy Strand of Baker Electric. Attendees can ask questions to our speakers throughout the presentation using the chat function of the webinar. We'll be collecting questions on our back end, and we will field these questions during the Q&A session after all presenters speak. Next, please. First up, our renewables tech team has been busy creating new resources based on what we've heard from our Better Buildings partners. Uh, all of these sol new solutions are on our Better Building Solutions Center, located on the link on your screen. Um, we have three things. First is a seven steps to selecting a solar provider fact sheet, which is a step-by-step -step guide to selecting a system and submitting in best practices for RFP. Next, we have our solar request for proposal template. This provides a format for businesses to present their solar project and a timeline to use for bidders. And finally, we have a cost proposal template, which is a financial tool that provides a price proposal template and an MPV template for your step-by-step -step solar needs. Next slide, please. Um, this is announcements for those of us uh, on the Commercial Real Estate Better Buildings Alliance team. Um, first up is our team is selecting new steering committee members for BBA partners. These partners will be on our steering committee um, for the next two years through 2018. And our steering committee drives a lot of the activities and priorities that we focus on throughout the year. So if you are a Better Buildings Alliance partner and would like to self-nominate yourself for the steering committee, please do so by June 15th to the website on the screen. Next up, for those of you that are attending the BOMA convention here in Washington, D.C. at the end of June, uh, two Better Buildings uh, campaigns are uh, uh, launching their awards at BOMA. The first is the Interior Lighting Campaign, and the second is the Green Leaf Leaders Awards. Um, those of you who have not submitted uh, Green Leaf Leaders applications yet and are still interested in doing so, those applications are until this Friday, June 10th. Otherwise, we will see you at the award ceremonies. Next slide. And Jay, take it away. All right, thanks, Cindy. This is Jay Patipati. I lead the Renewables Tech Team. And over the last couple of years, um, uh, kind of from two, 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 uh, two ends, we've been getting a lot of questions from members like yourself saying, hey, what is energy storage? I've got people calling me. I read an article about it. What does it mean for me uh, uh, owning and operating a commercial building? And the other side, we've seen costs come down. So why, why is energy storage uh, all of a sudden coming now? I mean, the technology has been around for 100 years. Um, so there, there's a lot of things, and this is just a high-level overview to give you some context for why, why things are happening right now. So there's a lot of demand. Uh, driven by, as uh, many areas of the country, renewable energy becomes uh, more cost competitive. It's intermittent, especially solar and wind energy. So utilities need to keep the lights on all the time. So they're interested in storing uh, renewable uh, energy. Renewable energy. Um, a lot of customers are interested in it. Uh, I think you might be interested in terms of backup power, maybe managing your energy costs. Uh, looking at from the utilities point of view again, they've got a lot of aging infrastructure. The current utility systems were built in the 50s and earlier and starting to age, and energy storage provides a cost-effective way for um, utilities to reduce costs. And then in general, there's a, a move towards a more um, networked or energy cloud type grid, um, so it's driving interest there. Now the other side, um, some of the drivers is uh, policies like um, in um, through FERC, uh, allowing energy storage to participate in certain markets, um, state policies driving energy storage uh, targets. Uh, the technology has become a lot more efficient, uh, not just the batteries themselves, but the electronics, 
the controls. Um, there's been a lot in the last five years since I've been working on it that's really come. Then uh, through the uh, era gr uh, grants in 2008 to 2010, there's a lot of technology demonstration funded of customer-sided energy storage and utility-sided energy storage that gave that did the broader electric power industry a lot more comfort. And then last, but certainly not least, cost reductions. Uh, costs have come down, I think, just in the last year. Um, Lithium-ion battery cut prices have come down 30%. So there's a lot going on that's driving interest uh, storage. So going on to the next slide, uh, what does this mean for you as a uh, commercial building uh, owner operator? Now, the, one of the um, neat things and also the challenging things about energy storage is it can do a lot of different things. So this uh, this slide, there's a lot of information here on all the different use cases or applications for energy storage. Um, and most of these are things that a utility would do. But for you, I think there's, depending on this, this is really depends on um, uh, utility by utility, where your build, where your um, building stock is, what it can do for you. But some of the straightforward ones are just um, if you have time of use rates arbitraging between high on peak rates and low off peak rates. Uh, second, depending on how, you, if you have a demand charge or maybe a power factor charge, uh, you can use energy storage to manage those things. You know, the the most straightforward one is if you have a demand charge, let's say from your highest 15 minutes of usage, your highest of hours of usage from 4 to 7 p.m. You could have the energy storage help you manage those costs. And then last but not uh, in this area, <clears throat> if you're in a part of the country that either has a cap on net metering <clears throat> or the net metering rules are changing, you could use energy storage to, instead of just throwing away that solar, <clears throat> uh, use energy storage to uh, capture the um, extra energy, the solar energy, and sell it back and use it later on in the day. <clears throat> and then at the bottom of this chart, there's, um, I think when some people think of traditional energy storage or what it had been you know, prior to five years ago is backup power. So using it for short-term and, and long-term outages um, to help. So those are some of the ideas. I think when you, when you look at energy storage and what it can do for you, I think these are some of the things you should think about. Uh, but you might, if you read articles or dig into it, you're going to see energy storage can do a lot of other things, but the ones in bold are the ones that I think are of most interest for you in helping you manage your costs and, and maintain reliability. So going on the next slide, um, costs costs are changing. This this is from last quarter, and I, I suspect these costs are lower now. So, But just to let you know, um, the cost situation is changing quickly. Costs are coming down. Depending on how long of a battery you need, do you only need two hours of storage, do you need four hours of storage, do you need eight, eight hours of storage, it's going to influence your cost. So it's not as straightforward as, let's say, um, I'm familiar, I come out of the solar PV world where it's dollars per kilowatt or dollars per kilowatt hour, and you can normalize by technology. This is a little more complex, so keep keep that in mind going forward. But this gives you some idea of where, where, where costs are. So going to the next slide. Um, when it comes to technology, there's a lot going on in, in, in the industry. So I tried to uh, bold some of the ones that I think are of most interest to you. Um, uh, I think we need to update this slide. Some of the colors might have changed a little bit. But there's a lot of ways to store electricity, right? It can be mechanical with batteries, flow batteries, which is a type of chemical, and then there's a lot of other things. For the most part, I think for commercial buildings, the things that are feasible in the near term are batteries, uh, flow batteries, which are picking up, um, I don't want to say picking up steam, but which are becoming more, uh, there's a lot more demonstrations and commercial products available. And then things like ice-based storage in certain parts of the country makes sense, and then maybe for short term, like power, for correct, power factor correction uh, capacitors. The reason I put this slide up here is if you go and start reaching energy storage, you're going to see a lot, a lot of information about different technologies. And, the, you know, the mechanical ones are really a bulk utility scale thing and there's some other things that are, are just um, are still evolving but uh, <clears throat> within this I will say the vast majority of energy storage being used for demand charge management is lithium ion so that's why that's highlighted under battery so this just gives you some flavor there's a lot of things out here but really I think you're interested to be the batteries and the flow batteries so um, that's the technologies now even more complicated I think and what's changing even faster than the cost and technologies is the business model. Um, it's a quickly changing space. Over the last six months, we've seen new business models come, and 
I'm sure in the next six months will be even more, but <clears throat> there's a lot of op options uh, for you to own the energy storage yourself, and this varies quite a bit by utility and by part of the country, so it's hard to paint a picture that, that applies everywhere, but um, similar to you that might work with ESCOs is a shared savings model for energy storage where a third party owns it and, and shares the savings, or you own it and share the savings with the third party owner. There's uh, variance in terms of who actually controls the energy storage. Do you control it all the time? Does the third party control it all the time? Does your utility perhaps have some control and, and uh, compensate you based on that? So there's a lot of changes going on quickly here. So um, I think as you look into energy storage, uh, ask the questions of, okay, what are the options for, um, for ownership and operation? And just be aware that they're changing pretty quickly. So that was a lot of information. Um, but that is what I had to cover right now. So I think with that, um, and we'll, I think we're going to save Q&A for the end, so hopefully if you have questions, just let Jake know. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Carl to talk about um, energy storage further. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just want to verify everyone can see my screen up here now. Um, so um, my name's Carl Mansfield. I'm with Sharp Electronics Corporation. And uh, Sharp has had a, a long and varied history in consumer electronics and also a 50-year um, history in the solar PV world. So um, first slide here shows a little bit of background about the um, uh, company itself. So. As I mentioned, we do have a 100-year track record. We have about 130 megawatts of energy projects in service in the US currently. So we're providing asset management of those um, mostly solar PV projects. Um, we're also recognized through you know, Sharp's corporate history of developing and providing innovative products that, that simply work and can be depended upon. Um, more recently, about two years ago, we formed a new um, operating division in the United States to uh, start to market our energy storage products and services to the uh, commercial and industrial space in North America. Um, so just diving in here, let me talk a little bit here about what the um, Sharps Smart Storage Energy Management System is. Uh, this system is a commercial behind the utility meter uh, battery storage system using high capacity batteries under automated intelligent control. And Sharp's predictive software monitors the site's consumption in real time and based on historical behavior and uh, expected behavior, we then predict where to dispatch and, and discharge the batteries to trim off those peak um, loads from the property and facility. And by doing so, under current utility tariffs in many regions of the US, uh, significant demand savings can be realized. So in essence, what we're doing here and what the primary value proposition for this particular kind of storage is very similar to a solar installation where you invest capital or you finance an installation, and um, through energy savings, you get a return on that investment or cash flow positive operation. Um, just in the bottom right of this slide, um, there's a few uh, feature highlights here of the system itself. It, it's available both in indoor and outdoor deployment options, uh, depending on a site's requirement. Uh, we have a highly scalable solution from 30 kilowatts up to uh, a half megawatt and, and higher. The system's fully automated, so as, as part of the product and service that's operate, offered here to the commercial building owner, the commercial building owner does not need to control, dispatch, configure, or anything of the system. Uh, all of that uh, complexity of operation is handled uh, automatically. There is a real-time uh, web interface for the host uh, beneficiary of the system to look at how the system is behaving and what savings it's been generated. And another critical point for this 
system is that it can be deployed either as a standalone battery solution or it can be deployed together with a solar uh, PV installation. And finally, uh, also as part of our offering, we do provide a 10-year asset management service to our customers, and that service comes with a demand reduction performance guarantee, which is somewhat unique in the market. So how does the system operate? Um, many of you may understand this, but a critical thing to really um, discuss first to understand the value proposition is how the utility bill is made up. So most commercial and industrial tariffs, except on the very smallest uh, commercial properties, uh, have their electric bill divided into three elements, of which two contribute the major portion. The first is the energy charge shown in blue on this slide. And that energy charge is, it, it may have a different tariff depending on the time of day when the energy is consumed, but in essence, it, it's sort of related to your consumption of kilowatt hours. Uh, supplied by the utility. And then the second element of the, the pricing here is the demand charge. And that is assessed by the utility measuring your maximum kilowatt uh, power draw at any point during the billing month. And then you are assessed a, a portion of your bill based on that demand charge. Um, demand charges in many regions of the U.S., California notably is one example, New York as well, uh, often the demand charge can be in the 40 to 60 percent range of the total utility bill. So it's a very significant uh, energy cost in many cases. When a storage system is deployed, such as smart storage, um, as the building's load begins to, to peak, so here at the right side is, is an illustrative load profile for a particular facility that's got you know, four fairly tall peaks during the day. When those peaks begin to appear, the battery system will, uh, under autonomous automatic control, will predict where the appropriate discharges should occur. And by discharging the battery and effectively supplying those, uh, the facility's peak demand from the battery instead of from the grid, the resulting peak demand from facility can be significantly cut and result in uh, dollars of savings. When the system is co-deployed with a solar installation, uh, we view this as really a one plus one equals three kind of scenario. So as the, the graph here is now showing, the, the solar PV installation will generate kilowatt hours to offset that energy charge. So your energy charge will be significantly reduced by the, the PV production. But the PV system itself cannot reliably reduce any of those peaks in, in, a, in a consistent and reliable fashion. Um, really, there's two major reasons for that. The first is that uh, it's an intermittent resource. So when clouds pass over, you will lose some of the output from the solar PV. And so you cannot depend on it. Um, you know, uh, providing full power output for the entire month of operation. And the second point is m many commercial facilities do actually have peaks in the 4 to 7 p.m. period when solar is starting to reduce its production. So what we find when the system, a storage system is co-deployed with solar, the two systems work very well in combination. and. Solar's impact on the load profile of the site can allow the storage component to achieve better demand reduction performance. And likewise, the storage component can help firm some of the production from the PV system to allow those demand savings to be realized. And finally, uh, the system, when it's uh, deployed as a hybrid solar with storage installation, can be eligible for federal tax credits, which can offset some of the upfront capital costs. Looking at this next slide, um, I want to dive in and, and talk about what we view as uh, four of the main critical considerations to uh, bear in mind when looking at uh, selecting and installing a, a battery storage solution on a commercial property. Uh, so all of these uh, drive toward the bankability of the solution. In other words, you know, can you rely on the financial returns 
uh, that the, the system is predicting or projecting it will produce if installed. And the four factors that we think are critical are listed here are safety, reliability, performance, and ultimately then costs. So when we consider safety, there are really five steps that are, are truly important to consider looking at a, a battery solution. The first is the system should have the appropriate component level safety and certifications. So there are a number of UL standards that apply to battery systems at cell level, rack level, and inverters and uh, control components. All of the solutions should carry the uh, highest level of uh, uh, safety certifications. The second point is that the system should be designed with those components integrated with a safety focused design. So in other words, um, interactions between the various components of the system should be designed in a way to avoid any safety issues. And the system then should, should have uh, undergone rigorous testing. And I think critical points that are often forgotten are the final two, which are once the system is deployed, it should be monitored on an ongoing basis to ensure safety. So just to give one example, with all of Sharp's deployed systems, we are monitoring in real time cell voltages and cell temperatures at those deployed sites. And if anything gets out of range, we can shut the system down to uh, avoid a safety issue before it may uh, become a more serious concern. And then the final point is that at the end of life of battery installation, and typically the lifetime is a 10 year uh, guaranteed period, and the system may have some life beyond that. Having effective end-of-life management for recycling and, and safe decommissioning of these systems is really important. All of these should be offered by a uh, supplier and service provider who is providing this kind of uh, technology to you. And uh, these are all part of Sharp's 10-year asset management solution that we provide our customers. Regarding reliability, again, um, battery systems, uh, unlike solar installations, um, they have, we like to say, more moving parts, meaning they have to be actively controlled and dispatched. With a, a solar installation, it, it simply produces energy as long as it's uh, available and, and well maintained. There's no active control required. So the battery market is relatively new. and in order to get the economic returns, you really have to be sure that you're selecting products from proven companies that will stand behind their warranties and guarantees. And again, this is a, a critical piece of the offering provided by Sharp and backed by the performance guarantee. And I will talk a, a little bit here about performance. I uh, won't touch on this a, a huge amount because Troy will, will pro be providing a, a case study to follow this presentation. But regarding performance, um, there's really three, the three key things that have to be done. The first is you've got to predict the performance. Then you have to guarantee the performance, which means putting a, you know, a, a dollar penalty on the line if you do not deliver some minimum level of performance. And then finally, you have to actually uh, deliver, assess, verify, and, and tune the system so that you can maximize that uh, performance. And we are confident in the performance of our particular smart storage system to the extent where uh, we are also providing a 10-year long uh, demand reduction performance guarantee, which is really critical piece to provide the, the bankability assessment from most of our customers. Then once you know that the performance can be relied upon and the guarantees are solid, the final factor, which is an important important factor is cost. And as Jay mentioned, prices and costs for these kind of lithium systems have been coming down dramatically in recent years. And so we're now seeing a quite effective, quite a good return on investment from these type of installations. But it's also crucial that the system is properly dimensioned for the needs of a site. So looking at an individual site's load profile, and there's some examples shown at the right side here from actual sites, um, it's important that we don't over-dimension or under-dimension the capacity or the power rating of the system in order to maximize the possible ROI from these products. 
And we also provide an extensive set of tools to rapidly review a site's operational profile and to create the appropriate um, uh, assessment to properly sign, uh, size and design a system for any given property. Uh, one other thing I should mention here is uh, that we do find that the system in general uh, is applicable to a very broad range of different property types. Uh, in particular, when co-deployed with a solar installation, uh, it has a very broad applicability. There are some properties that tend to have more narrow peak loads that uh, are better in terms of ROI, but even some of the longer peak load sites like hospitals that we've seen can have effective uh, ROIs in many cases. When looking at how to deploy this, uh, there, there's really two options here. Either a purchase on the system um, where tax credits can be enjoyed and local incentives can be enjoyed if available. And typically on these kind of installations, and there's an example cash flow from an actual project shown below, um, we're usually seeing, depending on the site's operational characteristic and its uh, geographical location, a three to five years return in, in the uh, favorable regions in the US can be achieved. So California in particular, this is fairly commonly achieved. In addition to a purchase option, which would require balance sheet financing of, of the system, there are also available, and, and we can uh, provide some further information on this if, if people are interested after the, the webinar, um, there are zero dollar down immediate cash flow positive financing offers available that are a combination of power purchase agreement or kilowatt demand reduction agreement and leasing type of structures. So these offers are available uh, both for storage only installations and for hybrid uh, PV and storage installations. So in conclusion, um, what I've talked about here is I, I've deliberately uh, avoided the backup power option. What I'm trying to show is the economic return benefit of these systems to a commercial property. And demand charges are a significant portion of today's utility bills. And a, a storage system like Sharp's smart storage can substantially reduce these demand charges. Uh, it's very important to select a product not just from a cost and ROI perspective, but to really properly understand the reliability uh, the safety and what performance is really being guaranteed and underwritten uh, by the provider of these products. So that's an important consideration when thinking about installing this kind of system. And the typical ROI for these is in the three to five years range. We've seen some cases below three years. Uh, I should say that, but three to five is more typical. And financing alternatives, as is the case in the solar PV industry, are also available. Uh, that's the end of my presentation, and uh, I'll hand back over to uh, to uh, Jay. Great. Well, now we're going to have Troy from uh, Baker uh, give a case study of <clears throat> installing energy storage. Thank you, Carl. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I hope your afternoon is going well. This is uh, Troy Strand. And uh, here at Baker, we install the system uh, on our roof along with the photovoltaic system a little over a year ago. So we do have a full year's worth of data, and I'll be presenting that. But a little bit of background on the company. Uh, Baker was actually established back in uh, 1938. So we are a... Uh, a long-term, privately held, closely held company, actually. Uh, we generated about $140 million last year. Our current bonding capacity is $75 million at a single project. Uh, I believe our aggregate is well over $150. Uh, we currently run about $130 here at our headquarters in Escondido, California, with approximately 800 uh, staff that fluctuates up and down depending on what we have going on in the field. We are a union contractor. Uh, we do uh, 
pride ourselves in the design build uh, arena and we do quite well at it. Um, our single largest contract at the moment is uh, just north of 37 million and safety is critical. So looking at product that uh, is going to perform safely and reliability reliably is very important to us. Our EMR uh, we jealously keep that well below one, that 0.73 uh, for 2015. And then a little bit about the market sectors that we serve. So uh, one of our, in terms of solar, uh, we, are in, we are serving the utility sector. We are at a gigawatt of installed capacity out there. And uh, in terms of substation work, we do that as well. We do have medium voltage certified uh, linemen and splicers on staff. We also pursue the battery energy storage arena at the utility or in front of the meter uh, side. We've done work for Southern California Edison uh, here in Southern California. But then we have cogeneration plants uh, at the uh, pretty large level at UCI, at John Wayne Airport, a couple other locations as well. Uh, Oshpod work and then also uh, the uh, medical office building as well. Commercial, we do pursue solar and battery installations, and then we are involved in education. It says K through 12, but it really should be saying K through 14 because community college are those who last 13 and 14, as well as higher education. We have a controls uh, group, and then we are also pursuing military. And then we're doing traditional commercial, vertical, horizontal type construction. So that's a little bit of background on the company. And had to get that out of the way, otherwise they'd probably kick me in the shins. So let's talk about the system. So the you already saw a picture of this that uh, Carl shared a little bit earlier. And w as we were looking at, as we want to get into the energy um, storage arena, we wanted to kind of walk the talk. So we wanted to put in a system and understand how it works. And lo and behold, we ended up with a lot of benefits from this. So benefit number one is the 10-year asset management that Carl mentioned. Along with that comes the performance guarantee. In our case, it's 25 kilowatts per month is the clip off the demand, or 300 kilowatts per year. And it meant a lot to us that it was backed by a larger company such as Shark. So that was those were kind of the critical factors we looked at. Uh, Shark, Mike Baker, long-term company. Uh, the system details. You can see the single line, a little bit small probably on your screens because I can barely see it myself. But the key points is we have an 86 kilowatt photovoltaic array on our roof, and we have a 30 kilowatt or 80 kilowatt hour battery storage system. And both of those feed directly into our, um, our main switchboard and get right out on our side of the meter from there. So here's a detail on, on an actual day of performance. And this is interesting to note. The red line is showing what our load would be without the PV and without the energy storage. The blue line is showing what our actual load was with PV and with the energy storage. And then you can see with the green what the PV is doing, and then the black what the energy storage is doing. Of note is on June 1st, you can see where the sun just pretty much obscures the clouds, and the PV system shuts off. Uh, and it didn't shut off. It was still operating, but at a much lower or diminished capacity. And I, I remember that day. We actually had a cell of uh, early monsoon season here in Southern California come through and just dump a lot of rain on us. Uh, had we not had the energy storage system, our system would have had about an 80 kW uh, peak load, and that would have been a pretty big heat hit. Well, not a big hit, but it would have, would have dinged our, uh, our demand charges, as has been pointed out earlier. So as we look at this, and I'm going to see if I can move this thing out of my way. I, oh, I can. Let's get that down there. Um, the, uh, 
as we look at our peak building load, we can see that our average is 84 kW. And then after the uh, energy storage and the PV, it's 53.7. And you can see the average of 30 being clipped, which is slightly greater than what the, uh, the power conditioning system or the inverter rating is of the energy storage system. And that's because you, the PV and the energy storage work in tandem. There are days where the PV does contribute, or months where it contributes. We can see it's done as well as uh, 39 uh, kW, and it's, uh, we have a couple of months where we were below, or below that 17 and 26. But the average is 30, and our average savings is 36%. And for some reason, I am not being able to forward my slides. So maybe someone can help me with that. Oh, there we go. Now, um, looking at, at the, the uh, payback, the system ran us about 77000 We're getting an average savings of 20000 a year, and we're looking at a simple payback of a little over three and a half years. You can see, again, we're just reiterating what the peak uh, load is after and before and after, and then what our dollar savings is per month. Some months, as would be expected in the uh, later summer, and then coming into the winter, uh, we actually get substantial savings in the range of 1000 to uh, 2500 a month. And then, just to wrap this up, my slides, my, my slideshow was a little bit briefer than the others. But the key thing here is installing energy storage with PV. At the same time, you can take advantage of the 30% investor tax credit from the uh, federal government on the energy storage. We did achieve a lower than four-year uh, uh, payback on the system. And the system is absolutely delivering as designed and as guaranteed from SHARP. So that concludes my present presentation. That's great. Thank you so much, Troy um, and Carl and Jay for all sharing your perspectives. With that, we will open up the, um, the, the webinar for questions. Again, as Cindy mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, if you do have a question, please submit it via the question box on your webinar panel, um, and I will propose it to our panelists. Uh, before I get started with our first question, I did just want to note that there will be a recording of the webinar as well as the slides available to the group um, after the webinar, and they will be available on the Better Building Solutions Center as well. So if you'd like to share this with any of your colleagues, that is an option. Um, the first question, and I might pose this to Carl, but Jay and uh, Troy, please feel free to, to jump in. What is the difference between an asset management service agreement and a manufacturer's warranty? Um, there's a couple of things. So what we do is we provide a 10-year management and operation of the system. So probably the major difference is there is the performance guarantee rolled in there. Uh, so um, it's not a hardware warranty, which is typically, you know, a, a material and defect and sometimes a performance guarantee. This is an active managed service. So after we deploy our systems, we don't leave the customer alone. We are managing that asset for them and tuning its behavior so as site changes may occur over the 10-year period in terms of the energy profile of the property will continuously manage and adjust the operation of the system to meet that. So it's really an active management service rather than a, a manufacturer's warranty. Um, hopefully that answered the question, but uh, uh, if, if not, please uh, ask again and I'll, I'll clarify. Well, I think that was great. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via the question box on the webinar panel. Um, that was our only question at this point. So um, Jay, I didn't know if you wanted to, to jump in quickly with a couple of the other things that the renewables team is working on. Um, and then I can see if we get any other questions over the next couple of minutes. 
Sure. Actually, I would ask a question to, to Carl. I mean, what what does O and M look like? Is it you know a a, a monthly service check? Is it a year a annual thing? Like, what kind of site access for preventative maintenance is required? Um, so these battery storage systems don't really need a large amount of preventative maintenance. Um, in what we have with our particular system is that the system is fully integrated with a, cr a cloud-based network operations center. And so our network operations staff are monitoring these systems in, in real time. And any alerts that get generated uh, that require, for example, some reset of a, a component at the site, all of that can be handled uh, remotely. So generally, um, you know, we may have a, a few issues that get handled on an annual basis that require some remote power cycling and reset of, of components that, that don't need any site visits. Um, then, you know, from a preventative maintenance standpoint, over a 10-year period, the systems don't really need much preventative maintenance. We do include in our asset management service an annual visit to the site for uh, inspection and, and so forth. Um, but most of our preventative maintenance is, is triggered by um, uh, monitoring the site's performance in real time through our network operation center and then dispatching a, a maintenance crew as they may be needed. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlike PV that requires you know, fairly frequent panel washing to maintain performance, we're, we're not finding that these battery storage systems really need a lot of uh, care and attention in general when they're being monitored in real time like that. Okay, great. <clears throat> and I have a question uh, for Troy. Uh, a question I get a lot is, how big is it? So how, how big is the system you guys installed? I mean, you have a really nice picture on slide three, but is it is that six feet tall, eight feet tall, you know, how much how much volume? Because a lot of buildings that I've, I've toured and walked around, you know, sometimes space is tight. So what kind, you know, how big, how much space is this taking up for you guys? Yeah, we're, we're covering about six feet high by about 10 feet wide of wall space with that system. And so space is a consideration uh, when you put it in. So that's 30 kilowatts, 60 kilowatt hours of, uh, of capacity. With a larger facility, larger than Baker's office building, you know, that, that footprint can go double and it could end up being a factor of 10 larger. Okay. And, and and for your system, what was the insulation like? I mean, did you have to have forklifts, or how heavy were was everything? Was it pretty? Uh, how did that work out? Well, you know, it is out in our prefab shop, uh -huh. or what used to be our warehouse, so we used forklifts. But okay, it it yeah, but more than likely, that's what you're going to offload with is forklifts. Just save people's packs. The 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 inverter, the uh, the battery modules, they they do weigh, you know, around 100 pounds plus. Sure. So, okay. In in terms let of me, interconnection, this, oh, go ahead. Yeah. This is Carl. Just let, let me kind of add to that. So, so the thirty kilowatt inverter, as as uh, Troy mentioned, is about a, a ninety five pound uh, unit, and then the the battery racks themselves. When you open those up, they they come. Uh, you know, for installation, the the batteries are in a drawer format, and each battery drawer weighs about hundred fifty pounds, something like that. So you know it is strictly a two-man lift, but the the system for the indoor insulation we have designed it so that it can fit in tight spaces without specialized lift equipment. Uh, so you know that's really been one of our in, intentions here. Okay, great, great, great. great. Um, and Jay, we have a, a couple other uh, questions from the audience. Um, okay. So one comes in and asks, is the system suitable for multifamily use? And if yes, do you think the economic case would be as compelling as the one presented in Troy's um, case study? Let me take that. This is Carl. Our first pilot system is actually deployed on a multifamily property. In, it's a six-story, um, half-city block, mid-rise apartment building with about 200 apartments. Um, that was our initial first pilot system. And we do find that. The economics can work on that kind of installation. Um, what we're doing there, this is in California, in San Diego. So um, that particular property, we are behind the common area meter, which has a peak load of about 100 kilowatts or so in, in summertime. 
Uh, so we're not doing anything you know, directly to offset each individual tenant's meter because uh, being in San Diego's territory, you know, every apartment is separately metered and has a separate utility account. Um, but the economics can, can work uh, on that kind of uh, uh, um, uh, multifamily property behind common area metering. Okay, that's great. Um, another question, do these systems typically draw down to zero or do you build in excess capacity? Um, this is Carl again. Let, let me take that one. So what we find is that the the day-to-day -day variation across a month on every property that we've ever, ever um, assessed, and we've probably done more than a thousand property assessments uh, now, um, varies a lot from day to day. So we design the system to use 100% of the battery's capacity on the worst case day. But when we actually look at the cycling utilization of the battery on an annualized basis, they're typically being cycled in the 15 to 25% range, depending on the, the property's characteristic. And so um, for these kind of deployments, we're really not hitting these batteries particularly hard. And one of the other things I should add as well is, although you know, in my presentation I'm showing economics based purely on demand charge reduction, um, another key piece of our asset management service is over the 10-year period, we will offer additional um, system upgrades as uh, utility tariffs programs or market options become available to allow increased revenue to be generated from these assets. So that, that's another you know, a critical difference between a, the asset management approach and just a pure manufacturer warranty approach. Okay, that's great. Um, once again, we'll, we'll leave the line open another minute or two for audience questions. Um, I don't know, Jay, if you had any other follow-ups that you would like to ask? Yeah, no, I think that I, I want to thank um, uh, Troy and Carl for coming to present today. We really appreciate it. Um, this is something the renewables integration team is going to start looking at further uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, <clears throat> building on the, the solar resources we've put together that uh, Cindy mentioned at the beginning and some other ones on our the Better Building Solutions Center, we're going to start looking at um, what you know what we can do to help commercial building owners look at energy storage. All right, and with that, um, I would. Just echo Jay's thanks to our panelists, um, and thank you all for attending. We will go ahead and conclude the webinar. Um, and as I mentioned, the recording and the slides will be available on the Better Building Solutions Center and will be sent via email to the attendees as well. Um, so thanks again for joining. Thank you.